is now my particular pleasure, pleasure to introduce the moderator of this panel, the Wilson Center's own Blair Rubel. Blair uh, is best known for uh, directing the Kennan Institute, which is the place to go in Washington if you want to learn more about the former Soviet Union, Russia, Ukraine, and so forth. Blair also, and that's really how he's so involved in this particular panel, uh, is the director of the uh, Center's Comparative Urban Studies Program, which takes a look at what's happening in regions here in the United States and around the world. Blair is a real polymath. He has uh, done a lot in the Soviet, now Russian space. He was at the Social Science Research Council at one point in his career. He was uh, also on the National Council for Soviet and East European Research. He has uh, published, um, I think edited some 20 volumes. He has done a series of monographs. He's one of these people like Senator Moynihan who has written more books than many of us have read. He, uh, than anyone has read. <laughs> <laughs> he ha you, if you turn on the television, you pick up the newspaper, you won't be surprised to find him being quoted or interviewed or having published a trenchant op-ed. And he is a prize winner. He has been uh, awarded the United States Vice President's Hammer Award for reinventing government. And by President Putin himself, the Russian Federation's Presidential Medal for Contributions to the City of St. Petersburg. So we might say that given his background, he has both a hammer and a sickle, <laughs> and will be uh, I, don't boom. I warned you. <laughs> I, I should know never to have Kent introduce me. <laughs> Blair, the uh, floor is yours. Well, the one thing I will say since you brought up the, the St. Petersburg Award, the really nifty aspect of it is I get a card that lets me ride public transportation for free in St. Petersburg. So, right. so unlike many awards, it actually has a practical impact. Um, but more seriously, um, somebody from the outside took a look at our program and said, well, the consumer is sort of pushed to the end. Uh, when in many ways, the consumer should be at the beginning. Um, I would like to say, I, first off, thank everybody for saying it has been a long day. Uh, before I get too far, I want to thank our friends in the AV staff here. It's been a long day for them, for sure. Uh, but just because this is the final panel, uh, I don't think we should look at it as the consumers being pushed to the end. I think uh, we see the entire day as a setup for a number of issues that really are critical if we're going to find our way out of where we are. And I think we had foreshadowings of that at the end of the last panel. Uh, you can't begin to talk about the housing market and any kind of resolution of the challenges that are faced without the consumers. And, and um, we saw a little bit of that in, in the polls and I, the polling data. And um, what I wanted to do, we have three uh, very distinguished specialists. Uh, Anthony Hutchinson is with the National Association of Realtors. Uh, Andrew uh, uh, is with the um, uh, Senior Director of Policy Development and Research at Enterprise Community Partners. And Jenneke is uh, down at the University of North Carolina. Uh, you have their, their bios. I would, would only uh, point out that with Anthony, we learned that geographers stand at the center of everything, <laughs> uh, which is something that I've long, uh, long believed. And, um, and Andrew has been at places in the center of these conversations. And as a Tar Heel myself, I'm always proud to share a podium with uh, a, a Carolina person. But, but more seriously, I think there have been some themes that have woven their way through the day that really get us to this discussion. Um, if we go back to the poll that we, we saw the results of, one of the things that is very, very striking, perhaps the strongest finding, is that the American dream is not dead. And the um, orientation of Americans around 30-year fixed rate mortgages has not abated. So what we begin to see is that uh, on the one hand, uh, consumers actually, they actually like the system that existed at one point in the past. The problem is that 
a number of consumers can no longer take advantage of that system. Um, the second thing we find among voters, and I think it's not only on this issue, is that Americans don't really like the idea of government being involved in their lives much anymore. So that there's a contradiction if, if some of the assessments we heard are accurate, that you need a federal role to, in, in some way in the market to provide what it is that consumers say they want. There's a contradiction there. And that contradiction is amplified by what struck me really as a third major theme of our discussion, which is there's no trust in the system anywhere. So without trust, how do you begin to build a system that will provide the outcome that people say that they want? Uh, the, uh, the American dream of a house and a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. And maybe, to, uh, Anthony, we can begin with you and mm -hmm. ask you about what you're learning from uh, realtors about how they're feeling and what they're seeing and hearing from some of their customers and clients. Sure, not a problem. Uh, I, they echo everything that uh, you just mentioned, uh, as well as some of the things that were kind of beginning to coalesce uh, around consumer angst at the end of the third panel. Uh, our members see that consumers still want to purchase homes. They are being reached out to on a regular basis uh, by people who want to take that step towards home ownership. Uh, the biggest impediment <coughs> that they're beginning to run into is that this credit pendulum, which had won prior to the uh, crisis of 08, which had become extremely loose, has swung to be extremely conservative. So folks whom you would have believed uh, should be able to get into a mortgage because they've got uh, a decent amount of down payment, they've got a, a, a decent uh, credit history, are now finding that they have been marginalized and cannot get into the space in order to purchase a home. Uh, that causes some angst for our members who of course want to get out and provide you know, services to these folks. And you know the reason that they want to do this is because our members are on the front lines. They're in the community. They want people to move into their communities and to enjoy them the way they do. And when they're unable to provide a service that allows them to take advantage of that, uh, specifically because of an, an over-tightening of credit, uh, it causes them a little bit of, a, of an issue, if you will. It makes them a little on edge and, ed and, and angry. Uh, that manifested itself a little bit uh, this past week. If you guys noticed, uh, the National Association of Realtors held a rally for home ownership on, in the shadow of the Washington Monument on Thursday. Uh, we had just over 13,000 realtors come down and profess that home ownership matters and that the dream of home ownership is still alive. Uh, these folks believe wholeheartedly that the way that you make a stable community, the way that you make a stable economy, the way that you stabilize and, and make a prosperous uh, national uh, or nation uh, is to have home ownership at the center of that, allow people the opportunity to purchase homes. Now, does that mean that they believe that everybody needs to be in a house? No. Does that mean they believe that there should be 100% home ownership? No. Obviously, there will not be. So there will be some people who may never be able to either have the financial wherewithal or the desire. Uh, we, cannot, we can't uh, you know, belittle that either. But the key is for those people who want to and have uh, a decent amount of down payments and have shown that they've got the wherewithal to handle a mortgage to take care of a home that want to be part of a community, uh, we believe that it, it, this dream needs to be made available to them uh, and it should not be taken away from them. They should not be held hostage because of uh, an overly uh, conservative credit policy uh, which is beginning to weld into the need for larger amounts of down payment that mm -hmm. we have not seen in, in, in decades now. Andrew, if I can get you in, uh, we were just hearing about barriers and credit issues, but how do you see the barriers in the financial system for allowing consumers to, to enter in? Well, I think that the notion that um, down payment should be the sole determinant of ability to become a homeowner um, is particularly challenging. If you think about the fact that um, you know, large segments of the American population have had um, some sort of distress over the course of the, the downturn, um, you know, credit ratings, um, or credit scores rather, are not what they were um, even a few years ago, even if you sort of rebenchmark uh, on a routine basis, which is part of the problem of kind of always trying to hit a moving target. But in general, if we say that you absolutely need 20% down, um, it would take the average 
mid-income uh, African-American rental household um, upwards of 10 years to be able to afford a down payment um, after you back out all of the sort of free cash. Um, and so if you think about, you know, it was mentioned I think earlier today in terms of the fact that folks are coming out of college with huge amounts of student debt, um, the next generation of buyers uh, will not materialize. Um, and so if you think about what the implications are for current homeowners, if they can't turn around and fi find a buyer um, to sell to, that has really profound implications for the mortgage market, for the health of the economy as a whole. But the flip side is, in terms of thinking about the finance system, I was actually heartened to hear Senator Corker this morning mention the multifamily sector. Um, in the context of the conversation around housing finance reform, everybody forgets about the fact that a third of homeowner, a third of American households are renters, they need shelter, and that shelter needs to get financed somehow. Um, the piece of the whole financing picture that actually that everybody forgets about, and this is sort of one of those sort of like insider, inside baseball kinds of housing trivia uh, tidbits, but almost six in 10 renters live in a property that is financed through the single family financing system. 58% uh, of American renters live in one to four unit properties. Those are properties that don't move through the multifamily channels, they move through the single family channels, and that system is ill-equipped to handle uh, investor-owned properties. I mean, we just don't do it well. Unless you've got cash to buy up lots of these things, um, there are investor limits in Fannie and Freddie. You can't get into FHA. Um, and so, particularly coming out of the housing crisis where we have large numbers of foreclosures, uh, a lot of those REO need to get repurposed into rentals because people who are currently renters who may, you know, down the road, I think it was Alan who mentioned it in the previous panel, sort of the idea of sort of a lease purchase type of arrangement where I'm in the property now, I like the neighborhood because of all the amenities it provides me. Um, you know, it has access to jobs, it has good schools, it has you know, low crime rates, relatively low poverty rates. Um, all the things that I aspire to as part of the American dream in addition to home ownership or the things that home ownership connotes, um, the, the ability to get into those properties or to make those properties available for renters, even if they're renters currently because of sort of a submerged situation or because they're renters because for the long term, they just are not going to have the economic wherewithal to become owners and not ready to take on the risk of ownership separate from the cost of the housing, right? I mean, sort of, you're now responsible for the leaky roof. You're responsible for the taxes and insurance. Um, all those other things aside from your mortgage payment, it may just not make sense for people uh, at the current circumstances or over the long term to become owners and we need to make sure that renters remain part of the conversation of housing finance in general because they have equal right to affordable and decent shelter as, as anyone else. I want to come back to the rental issue but uh, Janicki first I wanted to um, ask um, and I'm going to put the question in a, a pointed way um, because I've, I've heard some comments such as this if somebody can't afford a house, why does it make any difference to us that they can't own a house? Why, why is it important to address the challenge of, of financing for lower income owners? Um, I just wanted to add a, one other point that a clever observer here asked about the agenda and where are the consumers in all this. They noticed all the plumbing analogies and they thought that might give us a hint as to where the consumer ends up in all this. Um, <laughs> So, but in answer to your question, um, I, think, I, mean, I think Andrew started to touch on it. You know, who am I going to sell my house to and, and how is the housing market of the future? I think the previous panel as well talked about the um, substantial uh, loss in, in um, home prices we would have if some of these rules about putting 20% down or having a high credit score um, came into play. In fact, one piece of analysis we did at the center called um, Balancing Risk and Access, you can find it on our website. Uh, the researchers looked at all the loans made from 2004 to 2007, private label, um, conforming, FHA included, and applied these various filters that the regulators are trying to look at for the QRM. And um, the, the proposed QRM would cut out more than half of the good loans, that is loans that are still performing, that were made during that time period. And then they counterbalance that against the offsetting reduction, the marginal reduction in default risk, and find that it's, it's really not a very good trade-off. You're only marginally reducing uh, default risk a little bit, and you're, you're cutting out a huge chunk of the market. So obviously that would have re repercussions for the market as a whole. Um, I also want to talk about the importance of viable financing system for the, the households themselves. At, at UNC we study a portfolio of 50,000 um, families who got mortgages. Uh, the median income is $30,000 a year. Um, these were not borrowers who put down 20%. Most of them put down, actually most of them put down less than 5%. And um, these were made by lenders across the country, sort of in part of their um, efforts to meet affordable housing and, and CRA-type goals. 
And I put together a little brief here on some of the findings from this research. We've been studying these folks for the um, better part of a decade now. We, we track the portfolio. We track the property values, the credit scores. We also interview a sample of these borrowers every year, and we follow a companion group of renters who live in the same communities and are in similar, similar income tranches. And I tried to pull some of the findings from our research that get to the question of are we becoming a nation of, of, of renters and, and where, what can we see about the financial comparison uh, about owning versus renting. And so I touch on a number of those here and, and you can read them yourself. But I think the main point we want to say is that really um, in this program, uh, the, the homeowners have been large, remarkably successful given the circumstances. And a lot of this is attributable to the fact that they're getting the safe, stable, dependable, affordable 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Um, this is not, and then they've actually built a fair amount of equity and, and had lower user costs by our estimations than renters or, or than they would have if they'd rented similar properties. So this is not to say that homeownership has been a completely a bed of roses for these households over the, the period. However, for renters in the same income tranche, it's been an even more tenuous proposition. And so I think it's very important to understand uh, from a financial perspective what are the realities facing renters in the lower income segment compared to homeowners? And, and there's just really um, you know, still no other alternative way to build that kind of financial security. So, so the evidence that, that we present and what the prior panel talked about as well is that you really, it's very important to distinguish between uh, owners, uh, borrowers, and the kinds of products that they're taking out. And viable products can make viable homeowners, even in very high LTVs. Um, and we, we know how to do home ownership right. We know how to make these loans available to people, and, and doing so is good. It's good for the economy, and it's good for the households themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about why it, it's, it's good for the households. And um, um, I think we all know these stories, but I'll, I'll personalize it a little bit. My wife's family, is, she comes from a poor farming family in eastern North Carolina, and the fact that they owned land uh, in the end really helped subsequent generations because there was a pot of wealth that was passed on. And I think that's one of the reasons why home ownership is important uh, to the American dream. But maybe if we could talk a little bit about why when people sit down and try to think about how we fix a set of issues that affect you know, big Wall Street banks and everyone else, why should we even care about some of these households? Well, I'll, I'll share, share a story that was told uh, last week by a realtor uh, uh, you know, at our rally, it was kind of interesting. He is a uh, first generation, uh, well, uh, he, he immigrated when he was five from Mexico. Uh, and he talked about his family moving to Los Angeles. And uh, they rented probably for the better part of the first uh, 10 years that they, were, that they were there, so until he was 15. He said that his dad had turned down opportunities uh, to own a home, mainly because he did not understand how to purchase a mortgage. So because of that, he looked at his 10 years here, till from 5 to 15, as a very nomadic state. You know, they would stay in a, uh, you know, his dad would work a couple of jobs, his, his mom would work a couple of jobs, they'd rent, but then they'd have to move. They'd move somewhere else. They, you know, somebody, they'd move to another building where something happened and they'd have to pick up again and move. And he said that it wasn't until the third time that they, were eight, that they got moved out of their property that they realized, or that he and his father realized, that uh, in order to really put down roots, in order to really feel a part of the community, in order to, to really feel like you have something to contribute to is when you purchase a home. And the moment that they purchased a home, the moment he had some place to always come home to, so that after college he had some place to visit his mom and dad, to where he could visit his sisters and brothers, where they could have you know, the family congregate and get together and discuss whatever it was, that was the first time that, that his family had ever felt part of the community that they were in and then part of this great nation of ours. So when we begin to talk about or we think about, you know, trying to fix the housing finance system and why it's important, it's important because, you know, home is not just a financial tool or it's a financial device. Uh, I know we can think of it as that. It absolutely helps when you want to, you know, put your kids through college. It helps when you want to start your own business uh, and do some, some other things that you want to do. But at the, at the core of it, it is a place where families are able to gather. It is a place where we can commune and then be feel that we're part of something more than just what we do as individuals. And I think that's the real crux of the issue. At least that's the way our members perceive it. When our members go out and 
when they give a person a bottle of champagne because they purchased a house or they go through some sort of ceremony to welcome people to a home, they're doing it because they're welcoming them to the community. They're allowing, they're helping them put down roots. They're helping them feel as if they have accomplished something, uh, specifically first time home buyers. And I, and I think, so when we think about this system that needs to be fixed, that we can never forget that is really the end result, giving places, giving people uh, a home, some place to call home. I, I would wish I could tell great stories like that. I'm afraid that I have to resort to data. <laughs> that's why. I, and, um, we're all <laughs> stories of realtors. That's all I'm telling you. We're all stories. Um, the, I mean, one piece of data that we were presented earlier today, I'm going to come back to the financial aspects, but I think we saw in the, in the polling that the real values for home ownership are not even measurable in financial terms. They're measurable in, sa in safety and security and, and a place to raise a family and these intangible things. But back to the financial measurements, um, you know, what, what we report on is we have observed that over the extended period, considering both the, the some of the appreciation in the household but the median experience as well as some of the subsequent depreciation, they've still accumulated a sizable amount of equity and a double-digit annual return on equity on their investment that there's just no way they could have realized in any of the other kind of mainstream alternative investments. We also observed um, a lot of people say home ownership's not good, especially for low-income people because you know, they, uh, this causes them to, to have a poorly diversified portfolio. But what we see with the renters, who are of course not homeowners, is it's not as if they go out and then use the money they save to develop some kind of nicely diversified portfolio. In fact, we see the renters building sort of no kind of asset cushion. So when a crisis like the recent one comes along, it, it actually buffeted them worse than the, the owners. Um, another thing we observed uh, is that our homeowners, despite the fact that many of them gained a lot of equity, we do not see significant offsetting borrowings against the home. So this idea that people are just going to use the home as an ATM, it's nice in theory, but you know, the reality, at least of these 50,000 households over the last 10 years, is that they're not, that's not what they go out and do. Um, and finally, as I said, we looked at the, well, we looked at the user costs of owning versus renting and our calculation to all-in user costs for these families in these houses. The, um, in some years, it was better to be a renter than an owner, but over the extended period, the median owner actually fa fared better. And finally, we, we, we even looked at the households. We're not just talking about 20% down or even 5% down, but a lot of the borrowers in this portfolio had to rely on some kind of outside assistance for their closing costs and down payments. So it might be community grants or, or the seller or realtor and that kind of thing. And we actually find um, no increase in default risk for those households that, were, that relied on these outside sources of down payments. So we're talking about really thin down payments. Still, that risk can be managed with effective products and effective underwriting. Um, so. Andrew. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the other piece of all of this, um, again, less on the sort of narrative side, more on, I guess, more of the theory, um, but if you just sort of look at what is happening now with rental rates, um, you as a renter have absolutely no control over your user costs over the life of your tenure in the property, and yet that's the one biggest thing that you can control those costs of uh, as an owner. And so you're locking in today, obviously baked into the rates of some expectation of future interest rate environments, et cetera. But you're basically locking in your costs today, if particularly the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, right, over the course of the life of your tenure in that property. Um, and so it has spillover effects because if I've sort of locked in my costs in sort of nominal terms today, right, in real dollar terms, my cost of, home, of retaining ownership in that home only goes down over time. Uh, as opposed to a rental who is likely to see price rental rent rate appreciation um, in nominal terms, if not real terms as well. And so if you think about the impact then the spillover effects for the economy as a whole, I can then potentially put more towards my food budget, my cost of transportation, et cetera, because I've contained costs in one area of my household budget, which is otherwise entirely constrained. And so if you think about the long-term effect, not only is it about the ability to potentially withdraw equity from a property that's seen price appreciation over time, but simply your ability to manage your household budget, you've offset that component of risk, uh, and you've laid it onto individuals and to institutions that have far more tools at their disposal to hedge that risk. I mean, so that's sort of probably a bad thing to say in light of the, the J.P. Morgan you know, <laughs> debacle of the last several weeks. But um, in general, right, nobody is going to be sort of, as a homeowner, going to be involved in those sorts of hedging schemes um, that large scale institutions have access to. And so it's appropriate to ensure that the risk in the system r is retained by those who have the greatest ability to bear it. 
uh, and homeowners by and large, particularly low and moderate income homeowners, have the least capacity um, to do that. And so part of the benefits of long-term fixed rate finance and ownership in general is the ability to at least lock in some of your monthly costs uh, at a relatively favorable fixed rate um, for the duration that you're in that property. Well, we've had stories and data and theory, so um, <laughs> we're covering all the bases. But I actually want to pick up on uh, a direction you began to pursue, Andrew. If we may all agree that home ownership is the American dream and it's wonderful, but there may be a reality, particularly when you take a look at some of the folks who were not included in a poll of voters. Um, younger people, people um, uh, perhaps with, with lower income, but, but people who are a little bit, um, uh, they don't feel themselves sufficiently enfranchised to participate in, as voters in, in the system. Um, and they may not have options to buy. So if we are, in some extent, becoming more of a nation of renters, how effective is the rental market for meeting the needs of consumers uh, in terms of uh, stability, in terms of giving access, ready access to jobs, uh, educational opportunities? How, how is the rental market itself faring in terms of meeting the needs of people who are in it? So at the, the very lowest end of the, the income spectrum, the, the market rate, um, rental market, fails abysmally. Um, in most metro areas, there are an insufficient number of units at price points that extremely low income households can afford. Um, in most metros, as you move up the income bands, um, there is sufficient market rate housing, um, except you know, predominantly on the coasts uh, for a variety of reasons, lack of uh, you know, just the availability of land to build, um, you know, strong regulation, et cetera. There's not a lot of multifamily being built. Um, and the informal networks that are necessary to find uh, decent single family stock, uh, just those, those, those networks are just much tougher to navigate uh, if you don't have an already an in into some of those communities to know about vacancies, et cetera. And so um, the, the market as a whole does not do a great job of supporting the lowest end um, of the income spectrum. As you move slightly higher up, it, some places do better than others. Um, but if you think about sort of the, the neediest households, there is every public housing authority in the country has a waiting list. Um, there, uh, we basically have about a quarter of the folks who would potentially be eligible for housing assistance who are actually receiving it. Um, in terms of housing vouchers. So if you think about the, the, the challenges facing um, the, the neediest households, uh, they're still severe even in the rental space. But um, as you move up the, the income bands, and particularly in more moderately priced metropolitan areas, there is adequate um, rental stock. And we've done a, an, a decent job of ensuring that it's of, of relatively good quality as well. Uh, in a lot of places, though, you still deal with um, much, much older properties that are in need of repair. And again, it gets back to the question of how we finance um, the, the rehab of those properties. But again, particularly the single family, the small multifamily, the, the, even the, the secondary markets have not done a very good job um, of financing small multifamily, so the, the 5 to the 50 space, um, particularly the 5 to 20 space. The, the loan val balances are just too small uh, relative to the underwriting costs. And that's, that's a challenge um, that even if we're sort of comfortable with that the multifamily sector has, has fared relatively well uh, relative to the single family sector, looking at the books of business of the GSEs in particular, um, the, the small spaces is still very, very challenging to serve well. Um, it's more data that um, actually renters are much more likely to be paying a substantial portion of their income for housing than owners are. So I think um, well over half of renters today pay the more than 30 percent of their income for housing, whereas that's about you know 30% of owners who pay more than half their uh, more than 30% uh, of their income for owning. And the data from Fannie Mae actually recently shows the percentage of renters paying more than 30% of their income for renting is is on rapidly on the rise as of 2010. And um, more than almost a third of renters spend more than half of their income on housing. Uh, so I think, uh, and we've seen a lot of startups now, new starts in, in multifamily, but a lot of this tends to be concentrated on the higher price points and not in the sort of working family where there's no you know, subsidy really for housing and there's, and there's no, no good supply. And I think the same things that Andrew talked about for ownership really could be applied to rental. And then we can start to see a, you know, what we really want in a rental market um, 
being sort of a foundation for economic stability and eventually a stepping stone to home ownership. That is, if you can get affordable rental that has stable pricing that's near good jobs, you can see households begin to start to, to earn and live and start to build a little bit of an economic cushion, which can, can then allow them to sort of move up the housing ladder as they go. And a lot of that depends just the same way on long-term fixed rate financing, which is something that, again, Fannie and Freddie have brought to the multifamily side as well as the, uh, the homeownership side. And, and any kind of plans to revamp the secondary market, we also need to be thinking about the provision of the long-term affordable fixed rate mm -hmm. financing for multifamily as mm -hmm. well. And Anthony, what are uh, how do realtors relate to the rental market? What are they What are they hearing? Well, as uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, you know the majority of people that are in rental are in one to four unit properties. Mm -hmm. uh, those would be per perfectly in the venue of uh, my members who sell those to uh, investors and bring investors to bear. Uh, one of the things that we are uh, very interested in right now is the whole REO bulk sale uh, issue out there. Uh, we've been pretty uh, vocal about uh, how we believe that program should go. We have a white paper out there that you guys can, hit, can see from our website. But the thing that we believe is, is absolutely necessary if you're going to implement something like that uh, is to have the smaller investor who is in the community, who knows the community, uh, purchase the properties and then make them available to people in the community so that one, uh, the property is uh, appropriately priced so that you can have a level of affordability. Uh, two, so that the properties can be well maintained because obviously if you're in the community, you don't want to bring blight to the community. You want to ensure that the community uh, retains its value. Uh, and as a member of the community, that's something that's obviously of importance to you. Uh, so for our members, and, and, and for our members, the first step towards home ownership, and, and, and Janet can just mention this, is being able to meet your obligations as a renter, making affordable payments regularly getting a, a stable job, having some savings, becoming part of the community so that when you are prepared to make that next step, you have the wherewithal to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the things that is interesting is, and this is a, as Andrew mentioned, you do have a all of a sudden a rise, a, a spiraling to the top, if you will, in terms of uh, cost of uh, rental property uh, for uh, consumers, which we believe at some point is going to reach a point where you're going to, just as the housing market collapse pulled people from the marketplace, that is going to begin to push people more towards mm -hmm. uh, the home ownership marketplace. The question mm -hmm. is, when do we get to that tipping point? I wanted to turn a, a bit before we open up to uh, the secondary mortgage market and uh, why, from a consumer point of view, is this important? And um, what kinds of s policy measures do you think uh, really need to be taken to protect consumer? Uh, Andrew, why don't I start with you? Sure. So, um, I, as we mentioned, sort of the standardization component and the, the trust component, uh, I think is important. It's something that we got away from with the, the, the rise of the PLS sector. Um, you know, we say, you know, we're from the government, we're here to help, and everyone runs for the hills. It's sort of ironic now that Wells Fargo's new ad campaign here in D.C. is, we're Wells Fargo, we're here to help. I'm like, <laughs> sort of <laughs> the disconnect. I'm not sure who came up with that, but the, the idea that the, the you know, the system as a whole, or the, the actors in the system independently are going to come up with product that is consistently responsible and reliable, um, you know, and that the interests of the consumers are protected uh, throughout I is unlikely. And so I think, you know, I'm certainly glad that, that CFPB is now up and in, in force. Um, and I think that obviously the role they can potentially play in some of the, the mortgage documentation, the, the mortgage process is important. Sanitation certainly around servicing standards so that borrowers know if they run into trouble um, how to get assistance, what legitimate offers of assistance are. Um, the number of foreclosure scams uh, is really frightening because uh, scammers can always move faster than any regulator can. Um, and so, you know, even though it takes three to six months to get any program up and running, the scammers, you know, the moment the program's announced, they're already offering assistance and comments, all the, the help necessary. Um, so being able to crack down on those kinds of activities is, is part of it. But I think knowing that the, the secondary market is there, that there is an outlet for, um, for loans that otherwise might not get made. Um, if you think about the, the role of um, CRA in lending to communities that have previously been redlined uh, with all of the, the racial and economic implications for all of that, um, you know, I think it's important that the secondary market has a role to play to absorb the primary market's origination activity, um, that there's no creaming in the types of loans that they're willing to take that if a loan meets good underwriting standards, and we can debate QM versus QRM and mm -hmm. sort of 
how the two cars should have absolutely nothing to do with each other, and that's a separate conversation. Um, you know, I think it's important that the secondary markets provide the liquidity that's necessary um, throughout the, co the country. And that means that whether that's ensuring that individuals who meet credit standards have access, uh, that their mortgages have access to the secondary mortgage markets, uh, whether it's local lenders who have access to the, the market at fair pricing, um, or entire regions who would potentially get shut out. I mean, think about, you know, trying to lend into a Detroit or a Cleveland um, if there were no obligations to ensure that credit flowed in those locations as well. Um, it's not about individual borrowers at that point. It's about the system as a whole. It's about regional economies that uh, would likely suffer without some obligation to uh, buy loans that are originated across the board without prejudice. And to follow up on that, I mean, that's one of the major tenets of our uh, GSE policy, if you will, that there be a free flow of capital in all markets under all economic conditions, specifically so you don't have you know, players like Detroit, Cleveland, and other players at other cities or regions that may be a little depressed right now, you know, be totally shut out of the marketplace. Uh, you know, having a viable secondary mortgage market is absolutely vital uh, for housing finance and for uh, consumers that are out there. One, so that you can have access to that 30-year fixed rate mortgage. You know, we've, we've seen it in the polling. Uh, we want long-term fixed rate mortgages because of the stability uh, and pricing, th just knowing what we've got there. Uh, but moreover than that, moreover to that, uh, if you don't have some ability uh, or some secondary function to remove uh, some of the, the mortgages from the originators, uh, as we do with via the GSE model, you allow the consumer to become captured or beholden by these uh, private entities that can then charge whatever they want. Uh, and we began, we, we saw that a little bit. Uh, we saw that from 2002 to 2004 in the manufactured housing market. We saw that from, with the collapse of that in 04 as the ABS market went fully away and everybody who was in that, originating in that market for the most part went away except for the, uh, the GSEs. And then you saw that again uh, with the run up from 04 to 08 uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the conventional market uh, when everybody began to run towards private label securities. Uh, you lost a level of standardization in product. People began to price the way they wanted to price. And then as uh, the market fell uh, uh, into disrepair, you, you had the consumer there who was just kind of flailing and hanging out in the wind. Uh, you know, so in order to establish a level of standard, in order to ensure that there is maybe a, uh, some sort of net, some sort of control point that, that maintains uh, the ability of the consumer uh, to have a level of viability uh, in there uh, uh, as they move forward in purchasing a home or just sustaining their ability to purchase, you need some level of, of, of GSE or that, that function in the marketplace. The, um, you know, the polling showed, I think, that borrowers do, uh, consumers understand, or voters anyway, understand the close link between financing and home ownership, that viable financing and viable home ownership sort of go hand in hand, and we saw that. And so I think I don't quite understand how all that works and how they get that, um, but it's, it's useful to think for a minute about what the secondary market really does. Um, you know, first of all, it provides access to a globe we heard from the last panel or all throughout the day. You know, you need 10 to 11 trillion dollars worth of capital. Where are you going to get that if not from the, the global um, capital markets? And um, and so they they access that by redistributing risks. And in the case of Fannie and Freddie, as Andrew was pointing out, they 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 take out the default risk and they spread that over a, a large pool of, of borrowers and manage it. And then they are able to attract investor, investors who are interested in, is interested in interest rate risk. Interest rate risk is never going to go away. It's inherently part of the system. It's just a question of do you want to put that on the borrowers? And I think we've tried that before the Great Depression and about a decade ago didn't work so well for us. Um, the other place you can put it is in the lending institutions. And we tried that. Um, got the SNL crisis out of that. So it does appear that the, you know, the capital markets are probably best situated to hedge and manage, manage that risk. So th that's where you get the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, and that's what Fannie and Freddie and, and Ginnie Mae and FHA as well have brought. Um, have, that's what they're, they're providing. And the other thing they're doing is they're setting these standards. Somebody, I think it was also the last panel, mentioned how investors didn't want to read all the fine print on all these different pooling and servicing agreements. Well, borrowers can't necessarily read all the documents. <coughs> I've never had to read 
my closing documents word for word because I know what I'm getting. You know, I'm getting a conforming conventional mortgage and I know how it's supposed to operate. So that's a huge degree of consumer protection that's created through standardization. And when we talk about mortgage secondary market reform, whether you want to keep Fannie and Freddie or get rid of them, the most important thing to do is think about what are the functions and the benefits that they brought that we want to preserve. Um, you know, it's not the mechanism. The polling also showed that. People don't care about the mechanism, whether government's involved. What they're focused on are the benefits, which are, you know, the standards that are transparent across different geographies, across lenders, large and small, the sort of constant availability of credit, the fact that you don't need to read the fine print, um, that there's rules for servicing and loss mitigation that you can depend on, the TBA market, which allows us to lock in an interest rate before we have to actually close on our mortgage, um, and the role of ensuring that the system works well for as many qualified households as there are. Um, so these things, liquidity, st stability, transparency, affordability, um, con consumer protection, these are the things we need to focus on when we're talking about consumer, you know, what the consumer needs out of mortgage market reform. And you know, I'm part of the Mortgage Finance Working Group, which is sponsored by the Center for American Progress. They also have a plan um, for secondary market reform. It looks a lot like um, Jim Milstein's plan from earlier today uh, with a kind of a, a catastrophic government backstrop, but with a large role for private capital in the first loss position. We recognize that there's parts of the market where FHA, where 100% government guarantee is needed. We recognize there's other parts of the market, large down payments, affluent borrowers where no government mm -hmm. uh, support is needed to have a very efficient um, market working. But in this vast stretch of the middle, I don't know whether it's 35% or 30%, and we could all place bets and come back in a couple of years and see how we did, um, that that's where you need some kind of at least a catastrophic uh, backstop by the government to attract investors. And then you have to make sure that the benefits that that system brings are available to all qualified households, including those of low income mm -hmm. or of low wealth or single female-headed households or young borrowers. We hear about this. The polling just shows us what a strong aspiration towards home ownership these groups have, and I think that speaks really well for the potential future of our, of our housing market and our housing economy. Before I turn it over to the audience, I want to make one last run through. And, you know, there are two eternal questions in Russian life and Russian politics. Who's guilty and what's to be done? <laughs> and I think one reason why Russians keep asking what's to be done is they never get past the who, who's guilty <laughs> question. So let's put the who's, who is guilty question aside and, and make one last stab. You already, all three of you, began to hint at this. But uh, looking forward, what are the one or two key features of uh, a housing reform initiative you think are absolutely necessary uh, to have included? Andrew? Uh, I, I think access uh, and affordability obligations for the system as a whole uh, are critical. That You're not going to get credit flowing to places that need it um, if that's not baked in from the get-go. Uh, and it can be done in a variety of different ways, but uh, if you don't ensure fairly priced credit is, is broadly available, um, the system will come to a screeching halt. It's, it's a matter, we, I mean, everybody's talking about the ability, the liquidity um, that, you know, is so critical to the market function as a whole. If you drill down to the l absolutely local level or to the household level, if that liquidity doesn't become available, it's equally catastrophic. Yeah, wholly agree. Uh, I think the other aspect is just ensuring that that long-term fixed rate mortgage product is available uh, because that's going to get to your affordability in terms of home ownership. Uh, Consumers absolutely want the most simplistic uh, financing product available that's going to give them the most affordable of, uh, uh, payment that they can make. And they want to know, they want some certainty over the life that they're going to live in their house. And that's what you know, your fixed rate products offer you, be they 20, 25, 30 years, or even 40 if you want to go that far out. Uh, but the, o and the only way that we're going to be able to ensure that that is available, especially in that middle tranche, uh, that was just pointed out is to have some level of government participation in that market space. Now, how we do that, we, st we still have to discuss that and figure it out. But I think if we can start there and say, hey, we know that long-term fixed rate financing, specifically a 30-year product that's affordable, is what is desired, I think that drives the conversation. I mean, there, and there's actually a, l a lot of really good and viable ideas that have been developed that, that create this thing that we've been talking about. So I think we actually have the makings of a way forward. Mm -hmm. Um, the, this, what I consider false debate between should there be a government backstop or shouldn't be a government backstop, that just needs to be moved out of the way. That is the boulder in the middle of the path to housing market reform. And I think the sooner we can get past that and really start figuring out how to set it up, 
so that it's safe for the taxpayers and good for the, uh, that it creates the real public good that we all want for the better. And just to follow up on that, I do believe that we are beginning to see a movement toward the middle or a movement away from those two tails. Mm -hmm. or at least in the uh, conversations that we have up on the Hill, it seems like a lot of the stalwarts that were on either side are now beginning to realize, hey, look, you know, we're not, th the way we want it is not going to facilitate uh, this financing that most Americans want and feel comfortable with. So we're going to need to figure out how do we compromise and come mm -hmm. to the middle. And I think you see that in uh, some of the legislation that's been put forward. Uh, either the Miller bill, the Campbell bill, even uh, you know, somewhat in uh, uh, the Isaacson bill, uh, and then you've got Garrett Lee's private capital. So people are beginning to, to see that you need to start moving towards the middle. Yeah, I just thought just mm -hmm. very briefly. Uh, no, I think there's growing recognition that the elimination of a government backstop, the idea that you wouldn't have a system that has private capital ahead of government losses, would basically end up shifting the market entirely to FHA VA, mm -hmm. um, which is full dollar loss to the government from you know the first dollar loss. So at that point, um, you've the unintended consequence of not having an alternative government backstop is that you have an entirely yes, nationalized housing market, which is not where right. the folks who don't want to see the, the backstop end up. Or it all goes to the banks, which have FDIC government right. guarantees. Right. So it's yeah. too big to fail. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay, we have about 10 minutes. We have time for some questions. Let me see if, uh, I know it's late in the day, but let's see if there are any questions, comments, observations. Right down here, and then we'll go back up here. One of the things that's characterized American society is mobility. <coughs> no one's talked about mobile homes. Is that an element, part of the answer, or is that simply something that's part of the past? B before we get to that, why don't we take the, uh, the second <laughs> question? <laughs> <laughs> Knowing Eastern North Carolina, that's a very <laughs> actually a very important question. Well, I, I hesitate a bit to, to raise this issue, but it is um, a term that hasn't been raised, at least in this session, that's risk-based capital mm -hmm. and appropriately pricing for that. Um, I always assumed that, naive me, that everyone sort of accepted this sort of thing. And if there's some objective basis for assessing uh, risk of default, that there would be a competitive marketplace that would appropriately price that. Um, I'd like to know, I mean, at the low end of the market, I mean, there are certain, but there are certain facts that, that there tends to be a lack of a, uh, a cushion uh, financially, and there tend to be credit, or what we call credit events oftentimes, or life events uh, that create a disruption in, in uh, income. Um, and those things naturally tend to lead to uh, lower FICO scores or whatever, I mean, statistically. Uh, even in a competitive sort of market, now we, we can say, well, maybe many of those markets that they're operating in aren't very competitive too, and we can, we can discuss that, and there may be some viable truth to that. Um, but, but I'd just like to know, I mean, do, do you folks buy into for any sort of system to really work, at, at, especially at the low end of the market, that there will be differential pricing of that and, and potentially extension of, to ex by extension, other terms, uh, lower loan to value ratio, get coverage ratios required to be higher and so forth. Why don't we take these two questions and, and I, I, I want the mobile home question actually, I think opens up the, the prospect of alternative kinds of homes than we normally think of. Like mobile homes fill a real need in the marketplace. So, the, so uh, maybe if we can broaden that out to include not, not just mobile homes, but other new kinds of housing we see out there. So we have two big questions. Um, sure, I'll take, but actually I thought when you were going with the mobility question you were going to ask about sort of renting versus owning and the sort of job access question. So the, mobili the mobile home question, which are not entirely mobile <laughs> or not easily mobile, um, is, is certainly uh, an interesting one. I think the yeah, I think we need to broaden our, our sense of an understanding of what adequate shelter means. Um, mobile homes are challenging because of sort of the, the land issue versus the, the structure question is, is more complicated than it is with, with standard um, single family properties. But no, I think that, I mean, we also talk about granny flats and more intensive use of existing structures given the, the cost of construction of, of new units or the difficulty uh, of providing additional units. And I think that you know, we overconsume at the national level um, housing. 
Uh, and so one of the things that we've been doing a little bit of thinking around is you know, ways which, in which you might more intensively use the existing structures. Um, so you know, potentially formalizing um, and you know, sort of border types of situations and things like that, which also cre create additional um, income for, for homeowners that might otherwise have trouble making their, their mortgage payments. Um, and but getting to the risk-based question, I think, yeah, some level of, of risk-based pricing is, is absolutely um, legitimate. The question is sort of how good the models are and whether, you know, sort of lack of data means you get to charge, you know, some exorbitant rate simply because of the uncertainty risk. I think that's where it becomes problematic. And the truth is any lending activity um, ha bears risk um, of repayment. And any book of business, you effectively have cross-subsidization of that book. So I think that on some level, there need to be some realistic limits on you know, how high the risk-based pricing is allowed to go. And beyond that, you would sort of effectively mandate um, some cross-subsidization. It's happening anyway. The question, right. I mean, it happens in F I mean, it's happening more and more with FHA simply because you know, where the GSEs are playing, um, probably to the betterment of FHA at the end of the day, although they're also getting higher price loans, which are far more costly if those are the ones more likely to go bad. We don't have sort of as good data on, on those loan performances as we do on the, the lower price properties. But I think that those are the, I think it's a legitimate um, tool for mitigating risk, uh, is, is pricing it ac accordingly, but it's a public policy question is what degree of cross subsidization is appropriate. So for mobile homes, are we talking mobile? As in hook <laughs> up to the back of a truck, are we talking manufactured housing? Uh, because, well, I mean, I. Uh, mobile homes have evolved into manufactured Yes, yes, all right. So we're talking manufactured housing. Uh, no, absolutely, manufactured housing has a, uh, a role to play uh, in, in the housing market. I mean, there's a segment of people whom that is a very viable home for. The key is, you know, how do you secure and provide financing for that uh, specific segment? Uh, and it is a segment that is, uh, that, that, that does operate slightly different from your normal site built. And part of the reason I know that is because in part of my tenure at Fannie Mae, I focused on manufactured housing. Um, and during specifically, I focused on it during the debacle when everything was uh, falling apart. And repeat, there was a large number of repossessions that had to occur. Uh, the key, you know, one of the issues is you do run into a risk-based pricing issues when it comes to that because of the uh, the segment of population that that focuses on that. Uh, but the one thing that was really interesting that uh, I, f I saw toward the end of my tenure in dealing with manufactured housing is that it was also beginning to evolve into a uh, a higher end product, if you will, that was being placed in communities that one looked like regular communities and offered a level of, uh, made, just made it seem like site built and, they, and those loans performed a lot better. Uh, but when you talk about mobility, it is not necessarily easy to remove one of those from its foundation and then cart it somewhere else. And you run into the same issues that you do if you need to get rid of that property in order to move to take a job somewhere else, the ability to sell. And because this is an asset that uh, whose value does not maintain the way a normal site-built one does, uh, you tend to lose, the consumer would tend to be a little more beholden to that. Or And, and it's what you'll see if you go to some of the more rural areas, they'll just up and leave. And you'll have, or uh, you know, a different example is if the, the usefulness of that product uh, has been passed. The life of it has, 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 has expired. Literally, they'll leave it where it is and bring in a new one and put it somewhere else on the property that they own and let that one deteriorate. Um, so, you know, manufactured housing and, and, and supporting the mobility of, uh, of, of our workforce, I, I think you're, I, I don't think it, it, it's able to do what we would like it to do, though it does provide a viable uh, housing uh, option for some people who absolutely need it. Unfortunately, there are only a few players in that market space now. Uh, I think Clayton Holmes and a couple of other folks, and there's only one or two financing arms, and all of those are going through the, uh, the GSEs right now because there's no private placement. So I think that actually there's a, a common answer to both of those questions, and it, it kind of gets to what happens. Um, when you don't recognize the public good that we're talking about here in developing a, a, a comprehensive housing policy and a way to serve people, so in the manufactured housing space, when you don't have a good lender like the FHA who sets some standards and some rules or like Fannie and Freddie did, the alternative in the pure private play has tended to be quite predatory for, for manufactured home lending. It's one of the you know, most dark spaces of the, of the consumer finance industry. Um, 
And risk-based pricing, to some extent, is also true. You know, it, it's sort of um, when you don't sort of think deliberately about where you're going with this, you end up. Um, you know, it's not a substitute for managing risk. And in fact, it's not like car insurance. If you charge a, a risky driver more, it doesn't really affect their driving habits. But if you, if you take a borrower because of the fact that they have more tenuous income and a little less of an asset cushion and you substantially increase their race to reflect the risk of their tranche. So if they're in a narrow slice of the market where the default risk is, you know, one in 10, um, and you try to price that loan for that level of risk, you're just I increasing the risk levels. And, and one alternative to risk-based pricing is to do a little more careful underwriting and figure out which of the 10, <laughs> you know, whether you're looking at not one of the nine or, or the 10th one, and then just make a loan decision on that basis. And, and so that's much more the sort of the GSE model. And, and so you've got to think about the good that comes from taking all the borrowers that fit within the credit bucket and, and the ones, you know, you have, you have a big population of, of strong borrowers with low default risks and a small sort of tail end of a slightly riskier population, but that, that generally has proven themselves to be viable as homeowners, you can price across that, that pooled risk. It doesn't, it makes such a marginal difference on the interest rate costs of the people at the high end of the spectrum to accommodate those borrowers and provide them safe and viable financing that in turn, because they can get access to that financing, makes them more viable homeowners. So, of course, we have all we all live with some level of risk-based pricing. Obviously, there's an LTV break whether you go to FHA or whether you're adding uh, private mortgage insurance. There's some clear um, clear breaks that it makes sense to have some level of risk-based pricing. But it, I think it went too far in the subprime and uh, era. And I think also one of the big problems that risk-based pricing introduces is that it makes it difficult for me now to to shop and to understand what my comparative rate is. So I've got to go in a in a really risk-based pricing environment, you get a much more of a black box. And then I've got to go to one lender and apply and get a pre-commitment there. And if I want to know if I could get better somewhere else, it's a very difficult process. It's not like I can anymore look in the Sunday paper or look online to see if I could get a better rate somewhere else. And so that introduces a lot of risks as well that we saw come to the surface in the, in the subprime process. If there's one final question, in the very back. I'm wondering if uh, anyone has quantified the lost opportunity in not being able to um, efficiently uh, bundle smaller deals. Um, I work for a housing finance agency and right now we're grappling with um, the challenges of actually working with smaller developers. Mm -hmm. Has any data been gathered on that missed opportunity? I wouldn't say data, but uh, but I would say that you know if you read the um, lengthy plan that the Mortgage Finance Working Group has has developed on how to reform the secondary market, one of the things that gets into the nuances, but that in addition to just sort of as Andrew talked about ensuring that these that this this utility is broadly available and that there's access for all kinds of qualified households to those benefits, that you you can't. You don't really want to stop there, that you might need to build in some special mechanisms to, accom to accommodate kinds of financing that are just not, you know, economic or securitizable. I mean, you know, we, we all say sort of we don't want the GSEs to have the kind of portfolios that they used to have, but there is potentially some, some portfolio function. It could be for small loan balance loans. It could be loans that, that aren't that much riskier but a little more expensive to originate. It could be for small multifamily. It's a little harder to securitize, but, but could be held, you know, held in portfolio. And so a comprehensive plan when you get down to all the provisions to make for a, a full, you know, set of ways to deal with various um, inefficiencies in the housing market. That would be something you definitely want to have provisions for. It's very important. Andrew could probably talk about that some more. But yeah, and there are, I haven't seen any. I mean, that's part of the problem is it's the, you know, the argument from absence I is tough to make. Um, it's, you know, you get some of these deals done. Um, they involve a lot of brain damage for everybody involved, and they typically involve multiple financing um, sources, in part because nobody's willing to commit the necessary amounts, um, in part because it's just these are one-off types of deals, and so there's no routinization. The, you know, particularly on the small scale, the, the parties involved may not be as sophisticated. So there are all sorts of issues that, that come into play. And again, some, some level of standardization would certainly alleviate some of those challenges. Um, but I think the part of the solution is also to move to um, pool level financing uh, or sort of, you know, sort of institutional level financing for those developers as opposed to deal level transaction financing, um, which again is something that we're thinking about and ways in which that might improve. But it's, it's a challenge because 
you know, until you've done the first deal, you can't get, you know, it's kind of getting the process started. But once you have at least some level and of, you know, capacity, uh, and that's where, you know, things like technical assistance grants and things like that are, are incredibly important to, to build up the capacity of that sector to be able to then make the applications necessary to, to ease the process and lower the underwriting costs. Thank you all very much. Ken? We add my thanks to another terrific panel. I've uh, even got my mobile home question answered. I thought I was very impressed. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. This has been a very rich day. I particularly want to thank our uh, former vice chairman, David Messner. David, would you wave out there? We really. Uh, As vice chairman, uh, really, David got the Wilson Center doing a lot of new things, um, uh, things that we are still pursuing. He uh, also really twisted my arm and said, it's about time you did something serious on housing, and we've done our best today, and we, uh, we hope to revisit this question as we go forward. Uh, I think it's been a very rich day. We started with Senator Corker, who really impressed me as someone who was working. He was listening and he was looking to solve problems. And I think if we find that attitude spreading on Capitol Hill, it all bodes very well for the future. Uh, over the course of the day, we took a good look at what happened, where we are today, where we need to go, and we got pretty much confirmed what might have been at least our hope, that in fact housing is still very much, and home ownership is very much part of the American dream. And we heard now at the end of the day, what does this all mean for the future of the, the average American, for us, for our children? Where are they going in terms of access and affordability as, uh, as Andrew and, and Anthony and uh, Jericho have all put it? I, uh, I think one of the things that uh, really struck me today is the variety of expression. How many housing conferences or housing finance conferences have you gone to? where you heard Niels Bohr and Heisenberg mentioned on the same <laughs> panel. We've heard a host of thoughts that have been presented, I think, in a very thought-provoking way. We've identified challenges, and you've got a menu of solutions before you. Now, it's my pleasure, after having given you a day of food for thought, to invite you to join us at a reception in the Memorial Hall for Woodrow Wilson, and you might take a peek into the Memorial Museum there, which in fact, again, reflects an initiative that former Vice Chairman Metzner had us pursue. So thank you again for coming, and please join me in a round of applause for this panel and those that have come before.